Hi, I'm Justin McQuarrie, and I'm here with Bike Talk with Dave, David King, and Joe Laverick, and we're here to talk about the Rattlesnake Gravel Grind coming up in Sweetwater, Texas, um, March 21st and 24th. Hey, boys, how y'all doing? Doing well, Dave. How are you? Good morning. Today we've got David King in Sweetwater, Texas, and uh, he is the director of the Rattlesnake Gravel Grind, which we are talking about today. But we've also got Justin McQuarrie, who is last year's victor of said ride, and Joe Laverick, who hopes to give Justin a run for his money this year. Is that right, Joe? Yeah, that's right. Have a bit of fun with it, and we'll see what happens. Awesome. I love that. I love that. So, uh, Joe and Justin, we're going to get to you guys here in a minute. But first, uh, David, uh, what the heck is the Rattlesnake Gravel Grind, and why are these guys showing up in Sweetwater in March? Rattlesnake Gravel Grind is um, a four-day gravel event in Sweetwater, Texas, uh, benefiting the five volunteer fire departments of Nolan County. Uh, this will be the third edition. We've it's been amazing. We've brought people from all over the country, and um, now we're going international and bringing Joe in over here. Um, the way it falls on the calendar, it's just kind of in a sweet spot. This year, it'll be one week after Mid-South, and so um, Joe reached out to me. He's going to be coming over to Mid-South and then dropping down to Sweetwater afterwards. Justin will be returning for the third time for this year's event. Anyway, it's just a great community event that so many of the local, I guess, uh, volunteers will be at. Last year we had, I guess, right around 20 rest stops and aid stations. The local farmers and ranchers get behind this event. And we just have a lot of fun. We're able to cross over and go on different trails that we wouldn't be able to if it wasn't for this event. I've, I've lived here all my life and I've been on several of these ranches, but I'm, it's kind of the same for me. If it wasn't for this event, I wouldn't get to see this country in the same way that Justin will tell you. There's, we're on uh, wind turbine roads and oil field roads across local farms and ranches. And anyway, it's just a special event and something that local people have really started to hold near and dear because of how it brings everyone together so it's a pretty neat deal to be able to put it on each year i don't know if west texas hospitality is an actual thing but i sure uh you invited d and i and my son and his wife down slash up he lives in austin which is south of you um last year for 2023 and Oh my gosh. I mean, I've been on gravel rides, gravel races that you don't see a soul out on the course except for somebody a half mile ahead of you and somebody a half mile behind you riding their bikes. But you're right. There were aid stops all over. There were aid stops where you needed them for sure. Uh, top of the hill coming into the wind turbine farm, um, uh, all the corners that mattered. And uh, it was super helpful. Justin, I don't know if you even look around. You're going a heck of a lot faster than us. We're enjoying the scenery probably a lot more than you. But um, uh, how's this race for you? You've experienced a lot of gravel and uh, um, a lot of Texas gravel even. And, uh, and you keep coming back. What, what is it about this race that keeps you coming back? It's got to be that headwind for the final 70 miles of your race, isn't it? The, the headwind is definitely definitely something I can uh, maybe if I had one critique for the event, it would be a little less headwind. But um, West Texas hospitality is definitely a thing. Um, the whole town of Sweetwater, everyone involved with the entire Rattlesnake weekend does uh, 10 out of 10 isn't enough uh, to explain how how well, um, well run, well organized, well supported, well uh, motivated everyone is around it. And it's a fun event. It's a unique event. Um, and it's, uh, the level of gravel in Texas is growing, and, um, partly in fact, uh, because of what David's doing, um, in Sweetwater. 
Uh, Justin, do you get to enjoy the weekend of it much? Uh, we go as, it's a fun weekend. We camped, we enjoyed the music, we enjoyed the beer. Oh my gosh, the freaking barbecue. Oh, I literally man. dream about, I was up at the shelter and some dude is taking a smoked brisket and just chop, 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 chopping it. And I was like Pavlov's dog salivating at that stuff. It was so good. The food was amazing all weekend long. Uh, how much of that do yeah. you get to enjoy? Uh, thankfully, this last year, I got to enjoy the in, the entire weekend. And I'll be, be back this year for even more um, to spend a little bit of time in Sweetwater before the race um, and then staying through the weekend um, uh, to participate in everything that's going on. Because there's, apart from Saturday being the main event, um, there's rides both Friday and Sunday. Um, and you get to see parts of the course and then different parts of Sweetwater as well. Um, part of the um, unique terrain that there is to ride out there and then be around the hospitality that's just put on all weekend long. Great food, great people. It's, yeah, I, I can't really think of anything better to get out of the gravel. Uh, Joe, is that what brings you to, I know you're already in the States, but you know, uh, David here can brag an international field with your presence here this year, um, a British dude. Uh, is that hospitality part of the attraction for you? I think for me with anything in the gravel world, and especially in the States, it seems like after however many years racing on the road where you just fly in, you go hotel, start line, finish line, airport, home. It's like kind of the ability to just stay somewhere for a week and actually get to know the place is as much as the pull as the the race itself. Because like we've all pinned numbers on and race hard from start to finish, but it's like the stuff around it. Um, last year, Unbound was that great example for me because I had a horrible race. And then I took a step back and was like, remember you're here to enjoy bike racing? Um, and that's what I'm kind of hoping that it's going to be. Um, I, the more I hear about this, the more excited I'm getting. It's like the whole plan originally was to go mid-south and then go on to um, BWR and this, my buddy put me onto this race and now I'm just like really, really kind of stoked for this and yeah, I'm kind of interested to see what it's all about. Uh, so Rattlesnake Gravel Grind, again, it's, it's kind of a, almost a week, the 21st through the 24th of March, there's, uh, Shakeout rides, there's camping, again, food, I mentioned the food, beer, music, um, but there's also a race on Saturday, uh, 105 miler, 70 miler, and a 30 miler. Are you guys coming for the 30 miler? Not this year. I think, uh, no. I think, we're, going, I think we're going triple digits. Triple digits, 105 that. miler. <laughs> <laughs> um, Describe that course for me, Justin. If you've done it twice, you probably know it fairly well. You've done some of the shakeout rides uh, before and after the race. How would you describe the riding around Sweetwater? I have. Uh, yeah, so this will be my third year coming back to Sweetwater for the Rattlesnake Gravel Grind. Um, the course is it, it's really not like anything you'd expect. There's uh, elevation, elevation where you wouldn't expect it, um, especially for Texas, having longer climbs is not something you see all the time, um, and Rattlesnake is more than one of them. Um, the gravel is a mix of, like, smooth pack and then a little bit chunkier stuff, too, so it kind of takes, you got to be prepared for a little bit of everything. Uh, there's no single track on it, um, but I have heard there might be some course changes for this year, maybe trying something new out. Um, but then you also um, get to go on a bunch of people's personal ranches, and I believe maybe David's personal ranch or um, a relative of David's. Um, and it's, it's not something you see anywhere else. You get to be on roads, county roads in Texas, like small road stuff, um, and then mix that in with these more technical climbing sections on these ranches um, up through the wind turbines, past oil fields. Um, it's, it's really, really slick. Awesome. Um, Joe, you've got uh, pretty good chops on the road. You mentioned racing on the road quite a bit. What attracts you to gravel and something like this? Um, for me, it was probably this time last year, uh, maybe a little bit before. Uh, I was finished on the road with Hoggins Berman Action, an American registered team, and I didn't really know what I wanted to do next. Like I couldn't step up 
um, and then gravel alongside, like I still do race ride a little bit, it's, it's a mixture of the ability to still race at the highest level, but also the ability to like actually go to new places and enjoy them. Um, all of us here in Europe have done like the Circuit des Ardennes, the, uh, the this, the that of kind of French and Belgium stage races. So actually getting to see, um, for me next year, the States and Canada quite a lot and going to the communities is, that's kind of as much what gravel's about as the actual racing, but like bloody hell, the racing is still, uh, it's a lot harder than I first gave it credit for. I don't know how you guys go that fast for that long, but um, do you, have you done much gravel racing in Europe? Yeah, it's really different actually. Um, it's interestingly different. It's hard to put my finger on what exactly, but um, with the inception of the UCI series, it's just, I feel gravel over this side of the, the world has become a lot more road racy and not necessarily for the better. It's not both the racing wise and also the event. I feel you guys do, the racing side is just different, but the event is like 50 times better over, um, over in the States. We don't really do events that well, which is a shame. Did you race the world championships this year? Or last year, I, for that matter? No, I did not, actually. Um, I promised a friend I had his wedding that weekend. But um, <laughs> everything I heard Good from that was, yeah, I was very hungover the day of uh, world championships. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, but yeah, it's like, Worlds, I think, was an interesting one. Um, for me, the tracker here in Girona is probably the most comparable one to what you guys have. We make a week of it. We do the shakeout rides. We do <laughs> everything. And I feel the tracker's kind of becoming Europe's best gravel race um but it's certainly interesting the difference between what we have here and what you guys have over there um yeah my my i mean obviously our perception of european gravel racing is what we see on uh i guess tv or youtube or wherever it's playing um of the world championships and you just you mentioned one race that is similar to what we've got here in the U.S. Are there others? Like, is there a gravel scene that is not... The way I would describe the World Championships is uh, like Paris-Roubaix, but with gravel sectors instead of um, uh, cobblestone sectors. Although I think it was a little different this year, a little more gravel, a little more rugged. But it, is there a European gravel scene that somewhat emulates the U.S.? Um, I'd say that there both is and there isn't. I'd say race parkour over here is very, very different. Um, I just went out today reconning stage two or three, I can't remember which, of Santa Val, which is organized by Classmark here in Girona. And those guys are bonkers. Like, if there's a single track with rocks on it, they'll send you down. And if there's a 25% climb, they'll send you up it. Um, yeah, they're, honestly, it's crazy. Um, I'd say what we have here is probably the closest to what you guys have, as I say, again, from the event side, but parkours is night and day. We don't, the difference here is we don't have those big open gravel roads. Like, it's just not really a thing, apart from in Tuscany, maybe in Italy, but take the UK, for example, we have, we have muddy farm tracks, and then we have tarmac roads. We don't have gravel. Like, so we can't have good gravel races, we simply don't have the surface up in scotland it's a little bit different but you guys just have actual gravel roads where we almost have fake ones in the uk and europe you've got to go find them a little bit more um say drone i'm always going to be a big big fan of it because i live here we have a lot here and the parkour here is it's as much mountain bikey as it is gravelly hmm. but it brings another element into it huh. interesting um so a question i would have coming over here uh, there's kind of three, um, I don't know, three things going on all at the same time. One is independent gravel races like the Rattlesnake Gravel Grind that David works all year on, has volunteers, raises money for the local fire departments, rural fire departments that um, really need the, um, the money in order to do what they do. We're going to talk about that here in a little bit, David. Um, and then we've got the Lifetime Series, which highlights a handful of the biggest races in the U.S. Um, and then some other series like BWR, Belgian Waffle Ride. But then there's the UCI sticking its toe into things. 
Um, how do you guys feel, uh, Justin, let's start with you. How do you guys feel about these three things and will they work well together? Will they flow together? Like what's, where's gravel going? Like it's definitely in an evolutionary period um, and there's quite a bit going on and all of them seem big and important. Can they all be big and important? Yeah, so uh, that's a great question there. Um, so I, similar to Joe, I also come from a road racing background and I'm still actively racing on the road. Um, and from a road, I'm going to differ a little bit on Joe here. I do like to see the UCI and this more road racing style of gravel racing come come to the forefront now because it adds a different a different element to gravel as well. And in my mind, that's only going to grow the sport because that adds one more level of uh, athlete, one more level of event that can be had and still under the gravel umbrella. And then once you get more people into that, then they kind of transition between different styles of events. Um, and there's just more people out riding, racing bikes, having a good time um, off road, uh, which is, I think, really, really, really cool to see. Um, from the UCI side, I did race world championships this last year for the U.S. Um, terrible race. I was super sick. Um, so my, my day was bad, but the event was put on, I, I thought very well, like they were treating it like a real world championship. And a lot of the nations were focusing on it like a real world championship, um, which is fantastic to see because again, the more, the more people, the more nations, the more governing bodies that are looking at gravel as a legitimate thing. Now, the more, um, investment the sport's going to grab and that's only going to make for bigger, better and more events. Um, and I think based on the differentiation of what a BWR is, what a lifetime race is, what a UCI gravel race is, uh, what a rattlesnake uh, gravel grind is, um, they all cater to slightly different groups of athletes, people, um, anyone that might want to come out and participate. And once someone is either into that or has been doing a lot of one style of racing, then they're going to start doing a bit more. Um, and I think that's only going to grow across that. And we don't see that in any other discipline of cycling right now. So I think gravel's here, gravel's booming and it's, it's only growing. Huh? I, uh, I get that. Yeah. Rising tide raises all ships. Yep. Um, Joe, what about you? How do you feel about the gravel whole scene? I, I, I think it's like, quite simple they can all coexist with each other um you're gonna try and find uh, you'll always see journalists or podcasts or whatever trying to drag the other down depending which side of the fence they sit um but they all play to different um as just said different athletes and different people it's like the left the lifetime series is a mixture of two disciplines essentially um like you have the mountain bike in there as well or oh, well depending who you are you have a gravel bike with suspension at the front um then you have the UCI, which, like, let's be perfectly honest, the, probably the best gravel riders in the world are currently racing on the road um, because the road is where all the money is. So if you put Van der Poel, Matej Mohoric, Wout van Aert at the start of Unbound, you're probably going to have the three... Um, you're probably going to have them at the top. Like, um, but then I think kind of the quote-unquote smaller races, they have a different place to play because they're more community driven and they're events as much as races. So it's easy to point fingers at the UCI and I've done it an awful lot in my career on the road, but them coming on board, it's like, if it brings more ice to the sport, it's not a bad thing. It's kind of my do you think, opinion. do you think the UCI ne needs to regulate sock height in gravel racing? I think the, I had this conversation with someone yesterday actually, because he made a comment that my levers were slightly pointed in. And um, he was like, oh, there's a new jig for that. They're definitely going to be at gravel races with it. And things like that are where the UCI, like, I've always fallen out with them. Um, I think the UCI need to dabble, but not try and overrule. The second they try and overrule, it's just like, it's a waste of time. But they can, on the road, you have the classics, you have the Grand Tours, you have sprint races, then you have amateur races, you have everything, and it's kind of just similar to that. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, Justin, we were talking a little bit uh, before our online conversation about your road calendar, and you mentioned going to New York for a one-day 
and that one day is in association with the um, uh, Grand Fondo, New York Grand Fondo, which, I mean, if you dissect it, that's kind of what, like what the rattlesnake gravel grind is. You've got the uh, pointy end is full of pros, and then there's everybody else behind. And I know uh, road racing, you'd have to split things up a little bit differently. Uh, gravel grind, we can all start together and try to hang on your wheel for a hot minute. Um, although there is kind of a climb coming right out of the campground, so we'll just see you at the finish line. Um, but that's kind of the same same thing uh, for road racing. You've got uh, all levels of people. You've got people who just want to finish the thing, people who are doing it with friends, people who are doing it to see how fast they can do that course. And then you've got the pointy end that's doing it for um, uh, medals, podiums, and prize money. So, yeah, kind of cool. I do dig that. Um, David, I want to talk a little bit more about the Rattlesnake Gravel Grind and what it's about uh, because I just read an article about uh, some people getting their undies in a bundle at uh, Steamboat. Um, the rural population, the ranchers and farmers, not necessarily welcoming the thousands of people um, riding their bikes around Steamboat all day, all week. Um, what's your relationship with the local community? Because as Justin said, we go right through ranch land, private ranch land. Like gates are open just for us. And honestly, the scenery is beautiful that sunrise justin i hope you enjoyed that sunrise because it was breathtaking oh. i i couldn't not get my phone out and take some pictures and video during that sunrise but that was on private land ranch land same thing that they're having trouble with in colorado what's your relationship with the ranchers and why well when this all started the first person i had to get permission from was my dad was that a hard conversation? Did you have to buy him coffee or a beer or a shot of... Uh... Um, my dad's a big reason why this is a benefit for the volunteer fire departments. He's been a member of two different volunteer fire departments. And because of our farming and ranching background, he's been a part of it to protect our own land. And so whenever I asked him first, he was like, of course, it's for the volunteer fire departments. And I started out with our neighbors and started calling them and each one of them said the same thing. They said, yes, of course, it's for the volunteer fire department. We'll help out. And as I designed the course, same thing. I got to call up old friends and try to network around and figure out who owned this land and how we could cross it. And once again, everybody said the same thing. You know, sure, if it's for the volunteer fire department, we're happy to. Um, Around here in rural West Texas, we have actually five volunteer fire departments in Nolan County, um, and they stay busy. It's not just, we all just think of fighting fires and such, and this is a, most of the time, it's a very dry community or dry area um, of Texas. So that is something they spend a lot of time doing, but the volunteer fire department members, they're the guys that help out with everything. We get livestock out. They're average Joes that are traveling up and down the road. They're there to help out with everything. And God forbid there's a car wreck. Usually they're the first ones on the scene and they're there to help out and assist with uh, law enforcement or whomever's around. And so it's just a good group of people that, you know, it, it's, a, it's a great thing to be able to honor them with this event. And going back to my dad, he, we, we help out with the road race around here, I guess for, this will be the 11th year. And whenever I started helping out with it, I was having a discussion with my dad and my dad said, well, you know, just sign up the Lake Sweetwater Volunteer Fire Department, we'll help out. And so for all this time, the volunteer fire departments in Nolan County have helped out with that road race and they still do. And, Still will help out this spring when we put that on. But it's a neat thing to be able to get back to them. But 
the more we get back to them, the more the farmers and ranchers are happy to oblige to help them. You know, it's the way of the farmers and ranchers to be able to, I guess, donate to the event, to open up their ranch, to be able to pass through. It's not just allowing, you know, all the volunteers and the cyclists to go through the ranch. A lot of them, you can ask Justin, are sitting out there at their cattle guard or their front gate with homemade snacks there to give to the, the riders that are going to be passing through their place. I was really surprised about how there wasn't much pushback to be able to cross onto these people's land. Um, my family's been farming and ranching in this area since the 1870s, and so we've been around for quite a while. And um, like I said, because of my dad being around and helping out people over the years, that definitely made it easier to get through because it's one of those deals, we're opening our place up, would you open your place up? And um, anyway, it's turned out to be a very neat deal. Um, I never knew Justin before. I, I, I heard about Justin, I knew he was, you know, a fast cyclist down in Austin. He'd never been to Sweetwater and with the first event, him and Ted King had broke away from Matt Stevens and uh, myself and the photographer that were riding around uh, taking pictures of the lead group, we got up on the side of our mountain. We call it a mountain. It's a hill. <laughs> um, it's a mountain. It's, it's a mountain. It's a climb. It's a climb. It's a climb. But, uh, we got up on the side of our hill and were able to watch Justin and Ted King going up the side of it. And... Uh, Justin, I believe that was your first gravel race, wasn't it? I believe so. Yes, yes, it was. And I want to say that he told me he had his airs, the air in his tire, pumped up to what was it like ninety psi or something? It, it, I don't, know, I don't think it was ninety, but it was like seventy. It was, <laughs> it was way too high. It was it way was too high. high. But it was awesome to see Justin flying up that hill, a hill that I'd ridden up my whole life mostly on a mountain bike. I've done it several times on a gravel bike, but um, it was awesome to see Justin hanging with Ted King, you know, a Tour de France level cyclist going up that hill. And, and then later on, uh, Ted King had some mechanical issues and to see Justin chasing down. And I got to see it all, you know, right up close. Uh, and ever since then, I've been in communication with Justin and just maybe been his biggest fan since. I've, uh, I don't know. It's just awesome. It was awesome to see him. He got second place in the first edition. Last year, he won it. Won it in a sprint. Um, so that was neat to, to see. Um, and it's so awesome to see him coming back for the third round. Um, and as we said earlier, we're going to switch up the route a little bit. but. Don't fret. Y'all are still going to get to go up our hill. Nice. Y'all are still going to get to do those climbs. Uh, Good. I like those. <laughs> yeah. So. It, 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 jury's out for me. Um, <laughs> when you say hill, I don't know if you're talking about the one at the beginning of the day or the one at the end of the day, getting up on top of the uh, the windmill farm. Is that the hill? You, are those the hills you're talking about? Yeah, the big climb that uh, a lot of people had to get off their bike and push uh, guys like justin it probably wasn't that big of a challenge to him he he, well, he just shoots right up it that's my question <laughs> justin with freaking 70 pounds in your tires were you able to get up that hill the and so, we're talking about the one coming yeah. home right yep yeah that that final climb that tops out with uh 15 20 miles to go uh yep. when uh the year the first year with ted uh, we were able to ride it this year it was a little looser uh and we all had to we had a group of four that all um, I, I made, I attacked on that uh, climb and we all had to get off at a certain point and, uh, and walk for just a short section. Um, so it was a little too loose, even with appropriate tire pressure in. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, the first year we rode it, that was, uh, that was a very, very hard moment. And it, it's a very decisive moment in the race for, for everyone. I'm, I'm really glad to hear you had to walk that. Uh, because we we tried super hard to 
to get up that thing. We're on tandem, and uh, ah man, we were both just like disappointed when that rear wheel finally slipped out and stopped. And I did not drop her. Oftentimes, that's when like the tandem goes down, and I'm ready to clip <laughs> out. My wife is not ready to clip out, and she lands on the ground, and I don't. And it looks really, really bad for me. Um, but uh, I didn't drop her, so that was good. But uh, but I'm glad to hear that you had to walk up it. Joe, what do you what do you think? You getting a little anxiety about this thing? I'm intrigued now, actually. Like, I've got to admit, I, climbing is music to my ears. Um, I, I had a perception this race was going to be pan flat, and any time there's a climb in it, I like to think that's where uh, kind of some of my capabilities come into their own. So this is just kind of making me more excited. Ah, I'm super excited. I kind of want to be on the uh, quad with you, David, watching the front of the race. Um, cause we will be, actually we'll be ahead of you cause we're doing the 70 miler. Um, and hopefully we're, hopefully we beat you home again. 70, that's only 35 more miles. I don't know. Are we putting money on this? No, depends let's not how, put money cause that's how windy it is. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Uh, I got to tell you guys, and this, we're going to talk rattlesnakes here. Um, <laughs> Emily Newsom, uh, she is from Fort Worth, Texas. I live in Iowa. I'm an Iowa State fan. She is a uh, TCU fan. Iowa State, number 24 in the nation, played TCU, number 19 in the nation. So I laid down a bet with Emily that uh, whoever loses has to get a selfie with a rattlesnake draped around their neck. <laughs> uh, can we come up with anything for you guys? Joe, have you ever seen a rattlesnake? I'm actually kind of intrigued now. I, never, I didn't put any thought into what the name of this race actually meant. And now I'm like, oh, do man. I need to be careful if I punch her anywhere or <laughs> like, what's the score? I, I have been told, no, we don't need to worry about them in the wild. But there is a freaking rattlesnake roundup a week before, David, where they come up with 25,000 rattlesnakes. So they're out there. Well, they're collected from all over and brought to Sweetwater and... It's always the second weekend in March, and it was a decision made by uh, the Sweetwater JCs, I guess 66 years ago, to start educating farmers and ranchers about how to deal with the uh, rattlesnakes in this area. But to give Joe a little comfort, I guess you could say, all the snakes are cleaned up by the time you get here for the rattlesnake gravel grind. So. I don't think you got to worry about them. Uh, it's the springtime. They're generally dinned up. It's usually not warm enough to have them out and warm or running around or sliding around, I guess. <laughs> um, nobody's ever seen one on the course, alive or dead. So uh, not, not that you'll have to worry about it. Justin, you ever seen one on the course? Have not seen one on the course. We did see some after the race last year that I believe Emily was actually taking uh, selfies with um, before uh, before the bet even existed. Uh, her daughter had it draped around her neck. Yep, that was it. That was it. Um, so how about you guys? Uh, whoever loses between you two, selfie with the rattlesnake draped around their neck. That sounds that sounds like a that fair sounds, bet to me. That sounds fair enough. I mean, you see it at the tour down under on the road. They kind of. They have the day with the wildlife every year, so I mean, oh, why not get the two like of it. us, no matter the result? <laughs> yeah, I'm, 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 a, a double selfie with them sounds exactly. good to me. Yeah. All right, I think that's awesome. Uh, we're in. We'll we'll look forward to seeing all of you guys uh, March twenty first shakeout rides. I, I didn't say this before, but even the freaking shakeout rides, those ranchers are sitting with their the. Uh, back of their pickup truck down they got bottles of water in the back they got homemade snacks they got granola bars and that's on a free fun shakeout ride like they're the best supported gravel races and it's just a ride uh justin and joe will you guys be participating in any of the shakeout rides definitely yep i'm yeah i, I don't know what day i'm getting to sweetwater specifically but i will be there Plenty of time uh, to be riding um, on the 21st with everyone, racing on the 22nd, and then riding again on the 23rd. Yeah, I guess that's after the 22nd. Yeah. Yeah, yeah same here. It's like the thing with 
racing is sometimes you go, like you see all these aid stations, you're like, oh, I wish I could stop. But you're like, I spent time to come here to race. So it's actually nice being able to have the opportunity either before or after. Or let's be honest, if your race goes badly and you blow a tire up or you're just not feeling it, to actually stop feeling sorry for yourself and enjoy the, uh, enjoy the scenery and enjoy the community. I definitely have done some mountain bike races where I've had a mechanical. My time has just gone out the window. And then the whole, uh, my whole attitude for the race changes and I have a great time the final 20 miles or whatever to get home. That's happened yeah, I, uh, quite a bit. I find the first, I don't know, half an hour after it happens, you're just an angry, angry person. And then you step back and you're like, life's not too bad. I'm now just, I'm able to actually enjoy like riding or racing here, however you want to put it. And just enjoy the event for what it is rather than just have like laser focus on the wheel in front of you. Uh, I'm currently in Altea, Spain with my, my road team, Team Dover Norisk, um, for a training camp here. And I'll be, um, I'll be in Spain for the next uh, two weeks, um, finishing the training camp here and then doing a little, little bonus training afterwards um, in preparation for BWR, um, Arizona, at the beginning of March, and then heading to, heading to Rattlesnake after that. And then the full whack U.S. tour, yep. road tour scene with yep. uh, Gila and Redlands and uh, Joe Martin on your schedule? Yep. A lot of, all, I say a lot of, I say all, it should be all of the U.S. road racing that's on the calendar um, with a few more gravel races uh, in in the middle too. So it's, Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. And Joe, where are you right now? Uh, I'm in Girona, also in Spain. Um, a little bit a fair whack further north actually. Um, kind of similar, similar. I've lived here for a few years now, just kind of pootling away, prepping for my first race is La Santa Val in maybe three weeks time just a relatively small or getting bigger stage race here in Girona. Then it's um, over for Mid-South and the whole, like I'm going like Rattlesnake, BWR, and also Redlands. So Ooh, well, nice. I will be there. Nice. Yeah, I'm excited for that. There's a, I'm a time trialist at heart, and there's a little time trial in that, which I'm looking forward to. Awesome. Who are you racing with uh, on so the road? I'm, I can't say. Oh, OK, OK. To, 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 we haven't, uh, it hasn't launched. So there's a, yeah, I've got my hands tied on that until, until March actually, but I'm all right. Uh, te pri tease privateering. me a little bit. Te yeah. You're privateering <laughs> on the gravel side. And uh, then also racing on the road as well. Um, uh, guess, will you be guest on an existing team or new team? New team. Okay, cool. Well, we'll look forward to that. Uh, Justin, new team on the road. That's exciting, isn't it? Uh, I'm, this is actually my third year on uh, Team Nova Nordis, so uh, could be new. Um, but well, I'm not, no, I'm so, not talking about you. I, yes, I know oh, you're on Nova sorry. Nordis, but yeah. Joe's team forming for a new team on the on the road. Oh, that means gotcha. uh, road racing is healthy here in the U.S., oh, right? It, it, that means it's growing. Um, it's, yes. there, there's interest in it. Sorry, I thought anytime my name gets mentioned, I think I'm talking about myself. Um, <laughs> but I'm, I'm excited Fair to enough. hear I'm excited to hear about Joe's new team, and I'm very excited to hear that I'll be racing with him at Redlands as well. Awesome. Awesome. We'll see if you can maybe Redlands. I don't know what you guys could bet on there, but there uh, snakes, in that time, time trial, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I think Joe, Joe's got the time trial uh, bagged up, so I'm, I don't okay. want to bet on that one. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Well, I'll look forward to seeing you guys in March. Uh, David, will look forward to seeing you in, in March, spending the weekend down in Sweetwater. Um and uh, I'll look forward to getting to know you two better. Uh, Justin, I know you've got a great story. I'd kind of like to have you on for your own episode. Um, diagnosed with type 1 diabetes uh, when you're a little kid and you're racing with it and managing it. And I think that'd be a great conversation to have uh, uh, to inspire people that, hey, man, I can do this regardless of the challenges that I face as a, um, somebody with diabetes. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd love to chat about that. I've, um, like you said, I was diagnosed with diabetes when I was a kid. I don't know anything different, and I wanted to race my bike, so I, I'm out here trying to do my best at it, just pedaling as much as I can. Awesome, awesome. And Joe, I wouldn't mind having you on to talk about your transition from uh, the Euro road scene and uh, uh, getting into gravel and what led you there and, and why. But 
anyway, it'd be fun to have you on as well. Yeah, it'd be fun. Oh. I also feel as like I just I always feel like a bit of an imposter in the gravel world. It's like it's like I'm one of those few privateers which doesn't claim to be a gravel pro. Um, but yeah, I'm that kind of middle ground, bit of everything. Um, but yeah, hopefully, hopefully the first half of the year I can prove myself and get get some actual results under my belt on the gravel as well. So earn your place as a gravel privateer. Exactly. Oh, my stripes, oh, my gravel stripes or gravel blocks. I don't know what they'd be. <laughs> nice. I love it. Uh, David, we'll wrap up with you. Where does somebody go for information? How do people sign up and become a member of the Sweetwater Rattlesnake Gravel Grind community? Website's real simple. Rattlesnakegravelgrind.bike. Well, you do a great job of making sure everybody feels welcome. Love it. Can't wait to see all you guys there. Uh, have a eventful, fun, productive spring and uh, see you guys in Sweetwater in March. Ooh. Sounds good, guys. Thanks for the chat. See y'all in March. Cheers, guys. Catch you later. So I want to thank Justin, Joe, and David King for coming on and talking about the Rattlesnake Gravel Grind. It's a great event. It's a great weekend. Fun camping, awesome food, great music, and great bike riding, as you heard there. So I would encourage you to come down to Sweetwater, Texas. Head on over to rattlesnakegravelgrind.com bike to get signed up and for more information i also want to thank justin for coming on and doing today's episode introduction i had justin on recently and he is my next week's guest and he was kind enough to do our introduction so be sure and tune in next week as well to hear more from justin mccreary and how he has incorporated his diabetes diagnosis into his everyday life and how, how an athlete can manage a blood sugar disease, which has got to be super challenging. So dive in next week to learn more from Justin McCreary. He's a great dude. And I will look forward to seeing him, Joe, David, uh, Emily, and more at the Rattlesnake Gravel Grind in March. Another race that I am excited to see people at is the Core 4, where no surface is left untouched. Who's ready for some Core 4 news? After a huge spike in riders and a super thank you to everyone for coming out this year, these guys jumped right back into the fire. It's no surface untouched again for 2024 because Core 424 has a sweet sound to it, no doubt. New routes, new distances, and a new you. That's right, y'all. They are mixing it up with more surprises and delights. New for 24 is the Core 40 distance. Just a bump up from the 20 mile and still has all the farmscapes and B roads and champagne gravel you'd expect from the folks at Core 4, just without the single track. They're telling us 60 is the new 50, miles that is. It's a no surfaced untouched podium eligible route with all the cats in addition to their marquee 100 mile event. It's the perfect blend of competition and community. We want Core 4 to be on your event calendar for 2024. Jump on Bike Reg today, snag your spot before this event reaches its cap. Come ride the wave and get more bodies on bikes. It's blazing hot action every year and they'll keep the fire stoked all winter long with the 20, 40, 60 or 100 mile route, Core 4 24 has something for everyone. It's time for the next time. Let's go. Well, thanks again for tuning in. If you enjoyed today's episode or if you enjoyed this podcast at all, please rate and review on your favorite podcast platform. Uh, you can find all of these episodes at biketalk.bike and many of the newer ones on YouTube on the Bike Talk with Dave channel as well as some other fun videos such as a thousand miles to Nome and down the Kuskokwim. 
Well, the Arrowhead 135 is going off as we speak. They have until Wednesday, I believe at 6 p.m., 5 p.m. to finish uh, today, the day this episode drops, uh, 60 hours. They started Monday morning at 7 a.m. Conditions have been super challenging, very wet, very soft snow, warm temperatures in the mid to upper 30s, making pushing a bike super hard. I know there's been a huge dropout rate. Can't wait to talk to my buddy, Steve McGuire. I'm going to try and get somebody else on who participated this year and has participated in other years as well. Uh, We'll see what kind of finisher rate there is. Uh, I know as you listen to Ken Kruger's um, interview a few weeks ago, there's not always a 100% finish rate. Sometimes it's really hard. In fact, he talked about one year where nobody finished. There have been finishers, and uh, both male and female, on bike. I haven't seen a foot finisher yet, but uh, uh, maybe somebody came in while this podcast was being edited. I don't know. Anyway... Uh, Be sure and keep an eye out for our next Arrowhead 135, Dave's Big Adventure episode with Steve McGuire and hear about Steve's story up in International Falls, Minnesota. But for now, again, please rate, review on your favorite podcast platform. Hope you have an awesome week. Get some bike riding in because nothing compares to the simple pleasure of riding a bicycle.